It all happened during a hiking trip three years back. I have always been athletic from a very young age. My parents enlisted me into a rock climbing crash course when I was just 12 years old. I have taken years and years of training, and above all that, I always loved spending time in nature. I went on a hiking trip near Utah's White Mountains. The ambiance felt amazing as I walked amidst dense forests staring at the mountains surrounding the area. Forest has a different sound than any other landscape. I could hear owls hooting, the wind howling, and many unknown forest creatures hiding behind tall, wide trees and dark bushes. The sun was shining bright, but the forest was covered with big bushy trees, hence the sunlight could hardly touch the forest ground. Being a nature lover, I had a habit of bird watching as well. I always carry my binoculars whenever I go hiking. The nature around me felt so amazing that I lost track of time. While I was busy watching a big colorful bird fly away from one tree to the other, I realized the sun was about to set soon. I felt a bit hungry. I sat under a nearby tree and took out the sandwiches I packed for myself. There was plenty of time to get down the hill, so I thought to eat first so that I can get some energy. After eating, I got up and glanced at my wristwatch. It showed 5.30 p.m. In cities, 5.30 p.m. is not that late, but in forests, an afternoon can appear as night. I took out my torchlight and flashed ahead just when huge lightning struck in the distance. I looked up at the sky and noticed dark clouds have summoned themselves and were ready to pour at any moment. I didn't expect rain, so I didn't bring my umbrella with me. I got a little worried now and started to walk fast. I calculated inside my head that, after half an hour of straight walk ahead, I will reach the downhill road. As I walked, I kept hearing the dark clouds roaring above my head, the wind blowing rapidly among the forest. After 15 minutes, big drops of rain started to fall above the trees and a huge thunderstorm took place. It was thrilling, but scary at the same time. I was in a deep, dark forest, that too in the middle of a thunderstorm. The wind got so gusty that I could barely walk. The heavy raindrops almost pierced my skin after falling from the sky. I had no idea what to do, and just when I started to run, my feet get stuck in a pit. I fell on the wet forest floor. It was raining so heavily that I overlooked the pit on the ground. My flashlight broke with a loud sound and the atmosphere around me turned dark and scary. I somehow managed myself and got up, but after walking for 10 more minutes amidst this terrific storm, I realized that I have lost my way. I looked at my watch and it showed 8 p.m. By this time, I should be going down the hill whereas I was still stuck in this dense forest. There was no way I could call someone for help. The storm was growing with each minute. Suddenly, an idea came to my mind. I climbed up the tallest tree nearby and took out my binoculars. As far as my eyes went, I could only see the forest. Just when I was thinking about how horrible it would be to spend the night in these trees with an ongoing storm around me, I noticed a yellow light on the left side of the forest. I zoomed a bit and saw a wooden house standing there. I immediately came down from the tree and started to run towards the house. I was adamant because this was my only chance to survive the night. Panting and breathing heavily, I reached the house and knocked on the door. Anyone here? Please open the door. I could hear the low voices of people coming from the house. I knocked again and almost cried. Hey, please help. I got lost in the woods. Please open the door. With a loud creaking sound, the door finally opened. A man peeked behind the door and smiled at me. He told me in a very comforting voice, Good Lord, what happened to you? Please, come inside. I quickly got inside without any more delay. It was an old wooden house. The living room had an old rusty porch, two wooden chairs and a wooden table. At the center wall, there was a small fireplace. The man gave me a cloth to clean myself and said, Please, sit near the fireplace. You will warm up soon. I will go get my wife. I pulled the chair near the fireplace and sat on it. After a while, a woman entered the room with that man. I have never seen such a sad face. That woman seemed tired and upset at the same time. I thought she might be disturbed by my sudden interruption. The man guessed my feeling and said, 
My wife has been through a chronic disease for a long time. Please, make yourself at home. The woman creepily smiled at me and said, Yes, please don't mind. I often get lost in my thoughts. Actually, my son is very naughty. He is always giving me tantrums. I smiled and thought, how surprising that this family is living in the woods all by themselves. I didn't see a car near the house. I was wondering how they are managing daily livelihood in the middle of nowhere. Just then, the man said, It's common to get lost in such a deep forest when you don't know it well. We are living here for quite a while now. Our son Jimmy knows the forest even better than the owls and night creatures. I told them I came for hiking and got lost due to this sudden thunder. The storm was still going outside as I could hear the glass window clinking along with the whooshing sound of the wind. The rain almost stopped, but thunder and lightning kept striking the forest as usual. The woman offered me to dine with them, but I was already enough ashamed to break into their house, so I just asked them to give me a room to sleep for the night. I told them I will leave early morning so they have nothing to worry about. The man and woman smiled again. The woman said weirdly, Well, there's a lot of night left to pass. But don't hesitate, you are our guest for the night. She then looked at her husband and said, Darling, please take him to our guest bedroom. I will go and put Jimmy to sleep. The man took me to a room following a narrow passage beside the living room. He opened the door for me and said, Have a good night's sleep then, and please lock your door. Our son might disturb you at night. He is a very naughty kid. He barely sleeps. The man left. I had no energy left in me, so I locked the door and threw myself into the bed. The room was dark and the moonlight coming from the window helped me to spot the bed. I didn't want to turn on the lights because it was anyway matter of one night. I was just feeling lucky to find a shelter finally. I don't know how long I slept, but suddenly I woke up hearing giggling around the room. I tried to listen closely and heard it again. It was a kid's muffled chuckling. I remember the man told me to lock the door and I forgot. I got up on the bed and my eyes took a few seconds to adjust to the darkness of the room. The pale moonlight was coming from the window. I saw a five or six year old boy standing near the window, facing his back at me. I said in a sleepy voice, Hey, you should go and sleep. Your parents will be angry if they saw you awake. I was going to get up myself to take the boy to his room, but I couldn't do it as what happened next made my heart drop to my stomach. The boy looked at me. His eyes were white and huge. There were no eyeballs inside them. I said in a shaking, terrified voice, Who are you? The boy laughed like before and ran outside the room. I immediately got up and lit the light switch of the room to find my backpack. The room was very unclean. There was dust all around the room and cobwebs were hanging in the corners and the ceiling. The bed I slept on was covered with mud and an old worn sheet. I realized no one has used this room for a very long time. I looked for my backpack all over. Just when I remembered, I slid it under the bed before dozing off. As I kneeled down to get it, I discovered the ultimate horror. Three corpses were lying under the bed. A man, a woman, and a skeleton of a child in between them. The man and woman were recognizable as their corpse still had dried out flesh and skin on them. My head went crazy because I have seen them before. They let me in this house and offered me to spend the night in the room. I didn't waste a single second and came gasping out of the room. As I reached the living room, I glanced back at the narrow passage and what I saw terrorized me for my entire life. The man and the woman were standing at the end of the passage with their son. All of them had white big eyes with no eyeballs inside them. Their black hollow mouths were open to their chest. As I ran for the door, they all started to laugh in a distorted voice. I don't remember how I managed to get myself out of the house or that forest, but the next morning when I woke up, I found myself in the hospital bed. I had a bandage over my head, my arms were filled with scratches, and my body was covered in immense pain. A police officer came to me and said that some village people found me unconscious in the forest, covered in mud and blood. They informed the police officers, 
and I eventually ended up in this hospital. The cop asked me about all the details and without thinking, I told him all I could remember. I told him how I took shelter to a house of a dead family and every other thing that I could remember. The cop took a pause and said, I can't tell you what you saw was real or your imagination, but there is a house in the forest, but no one goes there as local people believe it is to be haunted. The house is completely abandoned and highly unusable for any living human being. I don't think anyone has lived there for the last 10 years. I asked him, but what happened there? The police officer said in a sad voice, a small family lived there. A man built that house to live in peace with his wife and only son named Jimmy. The boy fell ill with the bite of an unknown forest insect. He used to play in the forest even though his parents told him not to. They couldn't save their only son and out of pain and guilt, the man and the woman hung themselves. Some people say they did it to live with their little Jimmy's spirit. And since then, their ghosts haunt that house every night. The cop also told me that there's a saying that if you go to the house in the daylight, you won't see anyone. But at night, the house turns into a regular cozy home like everyone else's. They even heard laughter coming out of the house at night, like a happy family is having dinner together. Kim and David were having breakfast on a sunny Sunday morning, sitting at their house. David said to Kim, How about we visit our family farmhouse for this weekend? The weather is nice. It will be an amazing road trip. Kim's face lightened up in joy, and she replied, Wow, that's a great idea. I will pack our things. We will leave in the afternoon tomorrow. It has been five years since Kim and David got married. Both of them enjoy traveling more than anything else. Every weekend, they plan small trips by road. This week won't be different from that plan either. The next day, around 1 p.m., David and Kim started on the road. The farmhouse was six hours drive. David turned on the music in the car and said, We will reach around 7, 7.30 p.m. Kim said, Did you tell the watchman that we are coming? David nodded his head, gesturing yes. The view was breathtaking. Kim pulled down the glass of her window. Cold, fresh wind touched her face, and she felt so relaxed. As far as the eyes went, there were vast green fields and rocky mountains. Birds were flying high in the sky. Both of them were enjoying the serene start of their weekend. Kim packed cheese sandwiches and some fries. She took out the food and handed some over to David. David stopped near a turn, and they got out of the car to take a break. Kim looked at her phone. The signal was getting pretty weak. They were standing in wild nature. The high mountains and vast green fields were their only companion now. They laughed and chuckled while enjoying their sandwiches. No one realized how time passed. It was 6 p.m. and got dark. David told Kim, let's hurry up. We still have three hours distance to cover. Kim fell asleep on the way. David was driving on the wide, empty highway. He looked at his GPS and realized he was in the right direction. He needed to take a left turn after 15 minutes. Just when he was about to take the turn, something came under the car and the tires punctured, making a loud noise and heavy jerking. Kim woke up with a shock and said, Oh my God, what happened? David somehow managed the speeding car from bumping onto the nearby tree. The car stopped with a terrible creaking sound. He got down under the car and started to yell in anger. Bloody hell, who the fuck did this, dude? Morons. <sighs> Kim got a bit tensed seeing David burst out in anger, looking at the car tires. She too came down and realized David's sudden outburst is perfectly justified. Someone left broken glasses of beer bottles on the road. Some of the big pieces still have the labels of the beer brand on it. Kim said in a worried voice, Oh no, what will we do now? I don't think we will find any gas station nearby. David kicked on the punctured tire and said in an angry voice, Bloody hell! Being helpless in the middle of nowhere, the couple locked the car and started walking with their backpacks. They already knew that the left turn leading to the farmhouse is an empty road. They won't find any help in that way. 
so they walked ahead. They thought to come across a car that can take them to a nearby gas station. After half an hour, Kim said in a tired voice, My legs are hurting now. I'm too tired to walk now. David said in a worried voice, I think we made a mistake by leaving the car. We should have stayed inside the car because... Before he could finish his sentence, Kim cried in joy. Look, it's a signboard. David followed Kim's direction and saw a signboard was blinking at the right side of the road in the near distance. They started to walk faster. It was a roadside motel. Small cabins were lying on a wooden deck. A small hut stood on the left side. The door was opened. The interior seemed like a counter. There was no one there. There was a room behind the counter. The door was closed. David said in a hesitant tone, Anyone here? Anybody? Kim looked around and said, I think the owner is asleep in that room. Should we wake him up? David walked past the counter. He was about to twist the doorknob, just when someone spoke in a spine-chilling soft voice. Looking for a night shelter, guys? Kim and David turned towards the exit quickly and saw an average height man standing at the doorway. The man had messy hair and a creepy face. His eyes were excessively bright and wide. He smiled mysteriously and said, That's my room. I can let you stay there, you know, and started to laugh in a broken voice. David came to the other side of the counter and stood beside Kim. The man went to the counter and kept staring at them with his wide eyes. Kim said, We would like a room for the night. Our car got punctured. The man took out a rusty keychain and said, That's sad to hear. Room 101 for you. There's no food available here, but you can get snacks and drinks from the machines at the end of the deck. Kim took the keys and walked away. David asked, How much for one night? The man replied, Ten dollars, but you can pay later as well. David was in no mood to extend the conversation with this guy, so he left a ten dollar bill on the counter and left. Room 101 had a double bed, a small table at the right side corner of the bed, two chairs and a really big mirror on the wall. The bathroom also had a mirror. Kim got all freshened up, but she couldn't shake off the feeling that there is something really weird here. The couple was very tired from the exhaustion of the entire day, so they fell asleep quickly. Around midnight, Kim heard a beeping sound coming from the room somewhere and woke up. She got up and started to look for the sound. David was sleeping like a dead person, so he didn't realize any of this. After searching for a few seconds, Kim realized that the sound was coming from the wall. She walked close to the wall and found out that the sound was actually coming behind the mirror. She went to turn on the light, just when she noticed a small red light blinking behind the mirror. The light was visible only because of the darkness in the room. Kim pushed the mirror and she realized it is just hanging from that wall. Next, what happened gave a terrible shock to her. She took off the mirror and saw there's a small camera hidden inside a hole in the wall. The moment she understood they were being watched all this time, she rushed to the bed and woke David up. Wake up, David. We can't stay here. We have to leave. She started to panic. David woke up and listened to the entire matter for him. Someone hid this camera in the wall and the battery of this camera went dead, which is why it made a beeping sound. David got angry as hell and rushed towards the counter. The man was not there. Kim kept yelling, Please just leave. Let's go now. David didn't listen to her and bolted into the room next to the counter. As he opened the door, his eyes got transfixed in fear. The room was like a large concrete dungeon. There were huge glass tubes filled with some boiling liquid inside it. But that's not the only thing they saw in that room. Inside each glass tube, there was a dead body. It seemed like someone is preserving them because somebody's looked quite old as the skins were coming off. Kim wanted to scream, but her conscience told her that the only right thing to do now is to leave this hellhole as quietly as possible. Without wasting any more time, 
David and Kim ran out the room. Just when they reached outside, their blood turned cold. The man was standing on the exit of the counter. He had a sharp knife in his hand. He lifted his face and opened his big white eyes. His stare was like a hungry wolf. Saliva was dripping from his mouth. He took the knife and licked the blade with his tongue in a very bizarre way and started to chuckle. He then said, how do you like my personal collection? Kim was already in tears. She grabbed David's hand tightly. David was afraid too, but he said in a loud voice, you're one sick psycho. Once we get out of here, the cops will show you your right place, you maniac. The man laughed again and said, but first, you have to get out of here. And that too, alive. What happened next happened so quick that Kim still remembers it in fragments. The man came onto David with his long, sharp knife. But David was already prepared for such a moment. He knocked the man out with a strong punch to his face. Blood spattered from his mouth and he fell on the floor, unconscious. David took the man up and locked him inside room 101. They called 911 with the phone on the counter. After an hour, two cops arrived and the entire matter shocked the hell out of them too. They arrested the man and discovered a bunch of horrifying information. The man was a psycho killer. He used to trap cars on the highway by deliberately placing broken beer bottles on the road. After being helpless in the middle of nowhere, many travelers came to his motel asking for a one night stay. He placed a secret camera behind the room mirrors to keep an eye on them. When they finally fell deeply asleep, he used to sneak into their room and stab them to death. The man had the same plan for David and Kim too. That's why he went to sharpen his knife after seeing them asleep from the secret camera. Thankfully, the camera ran out of battery and Kim woke up at the right moment. For at least two to three months, Kim remained terrified about spending nights at unknown motels during vacation. David still checks out the mirrors and every nook and corner of hotel rooms whenever they go on vacation. Two years ago, when I was 15, my parents decided to go visit my uncle. I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay home and hang out with my best friend, Alex. Since we live in a quiet neighborhood and there was little crime happening here, my parents allowed me to stay home and have Alex come over. My mom left me a note on the fridge with all emergency numbers, and my dad told me to call him if anything happens. I assured them that everything is going to be fine. Me and Alex were just going to play video games and have some pizza later. They both hugged me and left. I called Alex and he came to my house 15 minutes later. We played UFC on my PS4 for two hours and then had some pizza. After our meal, we just sat in my living room talking about random stuff. Eventually, we started talking about girls. We both had crushes on some older girls, but the girls didn't even know we existed. Alex mentioned a website where you could talk to random people called Amigle. He also said that he talked to some girls there. So we decided to go on Amigle and try our luck. The first 30 minutes, we didn't get matched with any girls, so we started to get bored. And just when I moved my mouse to exit the site, two girls showed up on our screen. They were about our age, maybe a little older. We started talking to them, but they were just typing. We could see that they were talking, but we couldn't hear them. We told them to turn on their microphone, but the girl said that they don't have a microphone. We continued talking to them. We said that we were home alone, and so were they. They said that they lived in the same city and the same area as Alex and I, but we never saw them. After 15 more minutes, they said that we were cute and that we should hang out sometime. We were stunned. Girls usually didn't want to hang out with us, so Alex gave them his Snapchat username. As soon as he typed his username, the girls disconnected. We were really bummed out. We didn't even get their names. So we just turned off my laptop 
and went back on the PS4 to play some video games. Some time passed. We were still playing video games when Alex took out his phone. He just received a snap message from someone called Anna XOXO99. He opened it and it was a picture of the two girls we met on Omegle earlier. They were walking on the street and the caption said, Can we come over and hang out? Alex immediately looked at me. He didn't ask me anything. I already knew what he wanted and I said no. They can't come to my house. He wasn't happy about this, but I said no every time he tried to make me let them come over. Alex texted them saying that they can't come and that we should hang out some other time. A couple minutes later, the girls responded, Can we meet at the park then? Alex asked me if I wanted to go to the park. It was only 10 minutes of walking from my house. And I said no. He called me a pussy and said that he was going with or without me. Maybe he was right. Maybe I am a pussy. Am I going to pass on an opportunity like this? I looked at my watch. It was 10.30 p.m. So it wasn't that late, and my dad's friend lives right next to the park, so I thought it was okay. But if anything seemed strange, we would immediately go back to my place. Alex agreed. He sent the girls a snap saying that we were on our way to the park. They replayed the snap from Alex that we should meet, and told us that they were waiting for us in the children's playground. We got out of my house, and we started walking to the park. The whole walk there, I was thinking... What if something goes wrong? We don't even know these girls, and what if someone else was at the park with them? I didn't want to say anything to Alex because he would probably say that I was a pussy and that I'm paranoid, so I kept my thoughts to myself. After 10 minutes of walking, we got to the park. The children's playground was a little deep in the park, so I asked Alex to ask them to come to the main entrance of the park because we were already there. Alex just said, dude, come on, and texted them that we are in the park. A minute or so, we arrived at the playground. There was no one there. I asked Alex if they responded to our last snap, and he said no, they just left it on red. We waited there for a couple of minutes, but there was no sign of the girls. We were all alone in the park. I told Alex that they probably were just messing with us and that we should go home. But Alex wanted to stay a couple of minutes more. A minute passed and we heard someone walking behind us. We turned around and there was a guy dressed in black standing behind a tree looking at us and he had a creepy smile on his face. I said to Alex that we should go home and that this wasn't a good idea. Alex agreed and we started walking back home. The whole time, I was looking over my shoulder, trying to see if the man was following us, and he was, so I said to Alex to step up. Just when we got to the park's entrance, the guy grabbed my hand and started screaming in some insane way. I was screaming and kicking, <laughs> trying to get him to let go of my hand. I was calling Alex to help me, but he ran away. The guy started pulling me back into the park. I was screaming as loud as I could, and that was when I saw blue and red lights. The guy must have seen them too because he immediately let go of my hand and ran deeper into the park. I started running back to the direction of my house when a police officer stopped me. I explained everything to him, and he called my parents. The police officer took me to the police station to wait for my parents to pick me up. My parents came after one hour, and the police told them what happened, and so did I. My dad asked them, did they catch the guy from the park? And they said they were still looking for him. When we got home, my parents were glad that nothing serious happened, but they were still mad because I left the house to meet some girls I was talking to online. They told us to go to sleep, and that everything will be all right. The next day, Alex came to my house with his dad, and he apologized for running away last night. He also said that when he got home, he opened his Snapchat, and there was no sign of 
Anna XOXO99, and it was like she never existed. From that day on, I never went back on Amigle.